there's got to be an intelligent mind in, involved in this equation. The idea that, well, you know, man, there are an infinite number of universes, and we just so happen to live in the universe where I deal my hand, myself 20 straight hands of four aces. Come on, man. That is so improbable as to be ludicrous, isn't it? Um, yes, actually. Um, and you're a delight to talk to. Thank you. Uh, a, a point occupying no space with infinite density, or something like that. I'm not a physics major. But that's all it says. It says that the universe came from the point, but it doesn't say where the point came from. So we have no theories about that because we are not capable of knowing what kind of thing would create a singularity. All right. Well, in 1963, a guy named Arno Penzias discovered background noise, right? Okay. He got a Nobel Prize for it. That's the basis of the Big Bang. Background noise of the universe clearly shows us that there was a Big Bang. The universe is expanding. It began at a point about 15 billion years ago. And before that, there is no evidence that there was anything. There was basically nothing. Well, you, I think that you can't make that jump. You can't say that there is no evidence that there was anything, but you can't say that there is evidence that there was nothing. We have no idea what came before the Big Bang, but to say that it was an uncaused cause or something like that, that's theorizing crazy higher than we're able to do. Albert Einstein saw very clearly the implications of the Big Bang. Albert Einstein saw that if the Big Bang is true, it necessitates an intelligent mind of some type, a designer. That's why in his mathematical equations he put in a fudge factor to try and disprove the Big Bang. But his mathematical friends pointed out, Albert, this is dishonest, this is not right. And I respect Einstein. He had the humility and the courage to say, you're right. I put in the fudge factor. The Big Bang is true, and that is why there's got to be a designer. And I respect Einstein. He moved from pantheism to theism, to acknowledging there's got to be a designer. There's got to be a mind. Because this thing was the beginning. It started. Before that, there was nothing. We don't know that. I'm sorry, just to interrupt with your phone. It's OK. Um, Okay, well... And Einstein became a respecter of the intelligent mind behind it all. He didn't get specific, but... Um... Well, I, of course, have respect for Einstein, though not necessarily as much as I should. Um, and, you know, the reference to his uh, conversion to theism is a good point for your argument, but it's not... We can't argue about it. Um, you just say, Einstein believed this, and okay, yes, Einstein believed that, and... That does kind of lend credibility to the argument. I can't argue with it. Well, it's an example from an atheist going to point of theism. Anthony Flew is the same way. Anthony Flew, a brilliant atheist philosopher, a few years ago, converted from atheism to theism. Why? Because the order and design of the universe, which is being discovered in more and more intricate ways, points to a designer. And Anthony Flew said, I've got to follow the evidence. There's got to be some type of creator. Well, right now, well, uh, excluding the references to smart people who converted to theism, right now we're talking about the, cre the Big Bang, and that's not, we haven't moved on to the complexity of the universe, though I, I would like to do so now. All right, go ahead. Um, with, you know, okay, the, the human eye, or the yes. complexity of life, because yeah. God knows it's so complex, and the ongoing complexity of the universe and physics and all of that. Um, it is extraordinary, undoubtedly. Yes. Uh, but evolution explains how simpler things can become more complex. So, you know, you, the reason that we, uh, that, you know, you look to a designer when you see the Golden Gate Bridge and the same with humanity is because of its complexity. Mm -hmm. uh, Golden Gate Bridge cannot form on its, you know, own. Right. Because it's just so, uh, we see patterns and symmetry and we love it. Complex design. Uh, <laughs> But evolution explains how simpler things can become more complex. Sure. We have ch timelines of, in evolutionary history how different organs were used for different things and how things changed and evolved. And not necessarily actually even became more complex, but just emerged to see like they had a function. Uh huh. And that's a, that is explainable by science, by something we think of nature. So what, God is not required. Though, you know, it, it does it does kind of lend credibility to the argument, but God is not required. We, we don't need, we don't have, it's not proof. I agree it's not proof. 
But the question as a thinking human being is, what is most plausible? What is most reasonable to believe in light of the evidence? And there is absolutely no evidence that I've ever found that complex design comes about by chance. A delicious meal points to a cook. A painting points to a painter. A BMW does not point to a hurricane going through a scrap metal yard. It points to a mechanic. Everything in my experience shows me that complex design implies designer. So why would I part company with all my experience in life and say, but I think it's more reasonable to believe that the incredible complexity of the universe came about by chance. Okay. That's well, irrational for me. Again, we go to the complexity of the universe, but I'd like to stick to, stick to life for sure. this. It's more specific. You bet. Um, so, uh, again, we're talking about plausibility. Oh, I had a point. No, just oh, keep yeah. life. You're, you're a great point, life. Tell me about life. Okay. Well, it was what, it's, it's actually what I overheard you talking about yesterday, and it, uh, I, the exact words were, life is ridiculous without a god. Um, meaningless. Uh, you said ridiculous, but it doesn't All right, matter. ridiculous, really doesn't in, matter. in the sense of meaningless. Okay, okay. Then I uh, misheard the context. Um, it only had to ha we have not encountered any other life in the universe yet. So, for all we know, it only happened once, and it only had to happen once. And the probability you need to measure is whether that was improbable given the size of the universe. I've heard some calculations that it isn't. Okay, great. Thanks for bringing up this point. It's one of the reasons, another piece of evidence for God's existence for me. So you as an atheist believe life comes from non-life. I could never believe that. Why? Because in my experience, life comes from life. It never comes from non-life. That's why it's far more reasonable for me to believe we come from an eternal living being, God, than it is for me to believe that the life that we have ultimately comes from non-life. Never once in my experience have I ever seen life come from non-life. I see life come from life all the time. Plant life comes from plant life. Animal life comes from animal life. Human life comes from human life. Never once have I seen life come from non-life. That's a piece of evidence for me that God exists. Because it's far more reasonable for me to believe that life on this planet comes from a living being than it is for me to believe life sprang from non-life by chance. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. And I, I see, I think I see what you're saying with it. And it was a very good argument. My compliments. It's the best I've heard. You know, it's but a delight talking to you, by the way. Some people have an attitude that's incredible, but it's a delight talking with you, Russell. Thanks for treating me the way you do. I hope I'm treating you the same way. Well, thank you. Yes, you have been. Good. Uh, but, all right. Um, so, my point was that science does, you know, life is incredible. Life is difficult to imagine having come from nothing. But, given all of the facts that we've seen, there's no reason, you know, you were saying you, you, you've seen life come from life and you don't see a reason why it, it could have not. But I say there is no reason to think that it could have not, given the size of the universe. Okay. Okay, but then my question is, wait a second, you believe in the Big Bang, right? I believe the scientists that tell me about the Big Bang believe it. Okay, I believe the evidence is the Big Bang occurred. It occurred about 15 billion years ago. So we don't have eternity for life to come about. We've got about 15 billion years, which means you're telling me that 15 billion years ago there's a Big Bang and all of a sudden we have life coming from non-life on the order of a complex design that's off the charts and you're saying that happened by chance. So you don't have eternity. You got 15 billion years. And I'm saying for me to believe that life can come from non-life in a 15 billion year span of time I can't buy it. Well, it's so improbable. I would like to say, well, 15 billion years yeah. is an incomprehensibly large number. We, it's uh, you know, we, we, can, we can comprehend the sizes, you know, of, uh, the hundreds, thousands, millions, but only mathematically can we understand things. And, you know, like even a year, we, uh, we experience a year moment by moment, but uh, to experience a whole year, we can't comprehend that. We can't comprehend the length of a year, I, I say. But... My point is that 15 billion years is an incomprehensibly large number, and to say something could not happen 
in 15 bi billion years would have to be something that you mathematically prove, not something that you could look at and comprehend and understand. Also, the size of the universe is so big, and, that, and this makes 15 billion years look small, that again, to say that it wouldn't happen in that huge expanse right. is another, I think, faulty assumption. Okay. All right. Let's, let's go play poker. I'm dealing. Russell, if I'm dealing 20 hands of four aces a hand to myself in a row, I think you and the other guy is going to be pulling out your revolvers if I'm winning a lot of money. If at that point I look you in the face and say, wait a second, Russell, there are an infinite number of universes, and we just so happen, Russell, to live in the universe where I deal myself 20 hands of four aces straight. I don't think you're going to believe that, Russell. No, I'm not. I think you're going to say, no, Cliff, there's a conspiracy here going on. You're cheating. And that's why you've dealt yourself 20 hands of four aces. Uh, right? Yes. Okay, there's, there's, got to, there's got to be an intelligent mind involved in this equation. The idea that, well, you know, man, there are an infinite number of universes, and we just so happen to live in the universe where I deal my hand, myself 20 straight hands of four aces. Come on, man. That is so improbable as to be ludicrous, isn't it? Um, yes, actually. Um, and you're a delight to talk to. Thank you. I appreciate it, man. I mean, I, other guys will stand out here and say, oh, no, 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 no. I, I agree that there is, okay. uh, it would never happen on Earth that a person could deal themselves so, you know, that improbable of a set of hands. And this comes back to that uh, dead planet thing I was talking about earlier. But we and have all these billions of planets to play with. And life only had to happen on one, and when that life came about, it would look at itself and say, Wow, I am really improbable, because look at all these planets that don't have life. Uh-huh. All right. I got a younger brother, Russell, who's a transplant surgeon. He transplants kidneys and livers. Okay. I can promise you, Russell, if you and I have kidney or liver failure, we're not going to go to some homeless guy who's never gone to med school. We're going to go to somebody who, like my brother, who so understands the amazing order and design of the human body that they are capable of transplanting accurately and well a kidney or a liver or a heart. The amazing order and the design of the body demands an intelligent mind. And the way you live your life, when you get sick, you don't go to just some crackpot. You go to someone who's studied the order and design of the body. You know this argument. You, you live this argument out every day. You go to experts, people who've studied an area. You don't just go to anybody who's throwing the garbage up on the wall. There's order and design. And that's why you're here at university, to understand what is true, what is real, what makes sense, right? Okay. So it's that kind of evidence that demands that there is some type of God behind this all. Like after the, the flood, when God created the rainbow as a sign that he would never destroy the earth again and all the people on it, why did he later destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Okay, good question. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Now what I ask you to read is Genesis chapter 18. Abraham is standing over the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And God has told him, Abraham, I'm going to wipe these cities out. And Abraham's got a problem with that. Abraham says, wait a second, time out. What if there are 50 righteous people down there? You're still going to wipe them out? God says, no, if there are 50 righteous people, I won't. What about 45? No, I won't. Abraham says, well, what about 40? No, I won't. 30? No, I won't. 20? No, I won't. 10? No, I won't. Why did Abraham not go? 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, I don't know. But you see, what Abraham is struggling through is something that you and I struggle through, which is, is... God fair? Is God just? So Abraham has this debate with God over the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and God says, no, Abraham, if there are ten righteous people, I will not wipe it out. Why did God wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah? Because they had done so much evil that he chose, it's time to judge you. Why did God, a few hundred years later, judge the Jews? by sending them into captivity at first the hands of the Assyrians and then the hands of the Babylonians because the Jewish people had done so much evil that God chose to judge them. Why when Jesus Christ returns a second time? Will there be a day of judgment? Because God is good and because God is good 
He cannot allow evil to win. If you recall back in time, the, the church was in a position of power and people tend to abuse power. So why not maintain the church's power and so they can like make money off of it? But in the church, uh, officials make a lot of money off the church. And they used to sell tickets into heaven. Am I correct or incorrect? You're right, that happened. Mm -hmm. Do you think those are the dudes who wrote the gospels? Nope. What happened to the guys who wrote the gospels? Did they get tickets and get money and get drive BMWs? What happened to them, sir? Historically, what happened to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, James, Simon the Zealot, Thaddeus, Bartholomew? What happened to those guys? You tell me. They all got killed for their insistence that they saw Jesus risen from the dead. So, you see, that's why I'm asking you, sir. Why are you credible? So you've got to be very careful the way you answer that question, right? I mean, what determines credibility? First of all, you better get the facts right. And the facts are that all the guys in the first century who wrote the Gospels, who wrote the letters that we have in the New Testament, they didn't earn a dime. They didn't get any power. They had no popularity. Instead, they all got crucified or stoned or sawed in two put to death for what they claim to have seen. I won't argue with you on the intentions of religion when it started. Noble and probably peaceful, but now it's outdued its date. So forgive me to say. It causes more death and destruction now than it probably intended to do when it first started. You know, that's incredibly narrow-minded. No. <laughs> if I dismiss science because the Nazis abuse science, that's incredibly narrow-minded. But the church used to dismiss science. Just because the Christian church has done some horrible things tells you nothing about Christ. It tells you a lot about those hypocritical Christians. If you, sir, were to ask me, hey, Cliff, why aren't you Muslim? And if I were to say to you, because of the terrorists who blew up the World Trade Center on 9-11, I'd be a narrow-minded bigot. You ask me a serious question. Why don't you trust Muhammad? If I dismiss Mohammed because of some terrorists, I'm a narrow-minded bigot. When you ask me, Cliff, why don't you trust Mohammed? I better have the open-mindedness to go to the source document, the Quran, and find out what did Mohammed teach? How did Mohammed treat people? If I reject Mohammed because he's been misrepresented by some terrorists, I'm a narrow-minded prejudiced bigot. Similarly, if you reject Jesus Christ because of the Salem witch trials, the Inquisition, or the Crusades, you, sir, are a narrow-minded bigot. Christ obviously didn't call for the Salem witch trials, or the Inquisition, or the Crusades. He called for us to love and respect each other, not to wipe each other out. Make sense? Yes, sir. Uh, I was just gonna say, like, in support of your argument with the credibility, Last year you brought up how the women that saw Jesus arise out of the tomb, like they didn't have a lot going for them, like in in testifying to that. Like what, I mean, just for everybody's sake, like can you just talk about what they were up against? Like I think that adds to the credibility of the sources that they weren't doing it for self-worth, you know? Unfortunately, the sexism was horrendous. And women were not even allowed to testify in court. That's how bad it was. So obviously when the gospel writers record that Jesus first appeared risen from the dead to some grief torn women, that was not a way to gain credibility with their readers. But they had a commitment to the facts, to being honest. And so they recorded how Jesus rose from the dead and appeared first to some grief torn women. Let's say in this hypothetical, we admit that eyewitness testimony is false. What, do you have any other I mean, you gave reasons for like perfect ethicalness, um, his, the perfect life. Uh, these can be replicated and have been replicated in ancient mythology. Uh, what other reasons would you have to believe that Jesus is the one and true uh, savior? All right, the reason that I believe that Jesus Christ is reliable is because of objective historical evidence and personal experience. Okay, so um, what, objective historical evidence would you have? 
the objective historical evidence is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, historically reliable documents, record how Jesus taught, what he taught, a very high ethical standard. Secondly, they taught, they record how he lived up to that very high ethical standard. Thirdly, they record how he died at the moment of his most excruciating pain as he's nailed to a wooden crossbeam. Instead of cursing his enemies, he prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But fourthly, and most importantly, three days after he dies, he rises from the dead. But that's based on an eyewitness account. Correct. So if we... All right. So my basic question, I guess, really is, you also have mentioned the um, consistency, the logical consistency between the Gospels. But in, I remember reading, in when I was reading the Bible, in Mark, um, I do believe he says that... Uh, Jesus died before the Passover. And then in Matthew, it says he died after the Passover. Uh, how do you explain this inconsistency? Or one angel coming down instead of two angels coming down? I mean, uh, from my reading of the Bible, it's not that consistent. There are, I mean, there are no blatant, like, like Jesus went off to do this at this period of time while another guy says he went and did something different. But they're not exactly logically coherent in the fact that they all tell the same story. In fact, in the first gospel, you really, it, it reads much, much, much different from the last gospel in the, in including the fact that Jesus is God and divine, while the first one doesn't necessarily emphasize that fact so much. Yeah, I think you brought up a, a great list of examples. <clears throat> the first one is, when was Jesus crucified? You're right. There are some differences between the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in exactly when was the Last Supper. I think the evidence is that the Last Supper occurred Thursday evening, and then he went ahead and, the, and was arrested, and then he was crucified on Friday, and then he rose on Sunday. But the reason there's a different difficulty in those different Gospels is because there were two different approaches to defining exactly when the Passover began. Whether you came from Galilee or whether you came from Jerusalem determined your view of exactly when the Passover began. So you're right, there's a little discrepancy there. But if you study and find out why the discrepancy is there, what you find out is there were two different views of that in Galilee versus in Jerusalem. Second one with the angels, you're right. In one of the gospels you've got two angels and in another gospel you've got one angel. Well, as I told you yesterday, I appreciated the way you challenged me. I don't appreciate the way the other guy out here <laughs> dropped his little emotional statements and then runs off. So, tonight I'm going to talk to my wife and I'm going to say, you know the dude I told you about last night who I really respected? But he was out again today. And then later on in the conversation I'm going to say, and I spoke to over 50 people today. Well, you and I did have this discussion, but I also happened to speak to over 50 people. Right. So, what you've got is you've got a perspective. There was an angel. The Gospel writer doesn't say there was only one angel. He says there was an angel at that point. And then another Gospel writer says, and there were two angels. Not a contradiction, but a different perspective. So, you admit that there are logical inconsistencies because it's, I mean, man wrote it. So that would probably be another good reason why there's logical incons inconsistencies. And inconsistencies in this was what I was referring to beforehand. Um, but if you don't have, if you have these different other examples, of gods, which are just as morally perfect and just as morally ethical as Jesus, and you discount the personal testimony for the reason I gave before, do you admit that there is no real objective reason besides personal faith to believe in one God over another? Please give me the alternative that you view as better than Christ. Well, Mithra was, was, Mithra was described pretty well, Buddha was described pretty well. But wait a second. Mithraism is not based on an historical person. I do believe it was actually. Yeah, but a lot of Mithraism is developed long after Mithras, and it's in addition to. So Mithraism is not this historical person, and it's not a claim that God revealed himself uniquely through Mithras something that grew up in Iran and Iraq, I believe, Yeah, around after there. he lived. Okay. And when it comes to Siddhartha Gautama Buddha, 
obviously Siddhartha Gautama Buddha lived, he's a historical person. He obviously did not talk about God, he was agnostic. But what I so respect about him is that he struggled with the problem of suffering. But he never talks about God. And then my real problem is karma. Well, that's what's ignoring. Karma doesn't really make any sense either, I admit that. But, I mean, it's, it's, more, cool. of a, it's more of a like, it, I, I guess my analogy is more of, if I can think of and make or create an historical account of someone who is just as perfect as Jesus, would you have any other, would you have any reason not to believe in that account over another account? Oh, I can promise you, sir. If you gave me evidence that Jesus had not risen from the dead, my faith in Christ is bankrupt. It's over. But your evidence that Christ rose from the death is based on eye test eyewitness testimony. Right. And didn't we hypothetically agree that that wasn't a good qualification for objective evidence? You said that. I was. I don't agree with you. You don't agree with me, even no. though science says that most uh, eyewitness accounts are unreliable. Sir, if you get married, yes, you're going to be making one whale of a big commitment to that woman, aren't you? Yes, sir. It's going to have nothing to do with science. It's going to have everything to do with history. <laughs> it's going to have everything to do with your eyewitness ex and your experience. Yeah, but this woman. I have personal right? eyewitness experience with this woman. Yeah. Over a long period of time. Yeah. So exactly. But the difference is, these was one why eyewitness account at a specific time, of which there were <laughs> at most three people watching. And I know that's enough to kill people in Texas, but I don't think that's right. Yeah, well, there are over 500 people who saw Jesus risen from the dead. Afterwards. Like, yeah. Yeah, after he rose from the dead. They saw him. And supposedly that those 500 people who were not necessarily direct eyewitnesses, they saw some, apparently, an apparition, a spiritual form of Jesus walk among them. No, they saw a physical body. You, you think that he actually physically came back because that's not my interpretation of the Bible. But that, it doesn't matter what Come I... Come on. It, it doesn't you got matter. Thomas right there. Thomas saying... I, your, I'm not going to believe unless I can see him put my hands in the nail prints in his hands. And you, okay, I do remember that story. And it's in John. Right, yes. But just because someone, and, and my biggest problem to that is, is who had the tape recorder recording all of the conversations back then? Nobody had a tape recorder, nobody then had how do you a know DVD what they recorder. Said? Nobody had video at that time. That's my point. How, they, the Bible reads like... Haven't you seen Forrest like, Gump? of first person and narratory. Just because you got a video camera doesn't mean you can't doctor the video, the tape. You're, Forrest Gump shakes Kennedy's hand. You don't think that really occurred, do you? No, but that's... So just because you got it on video doesn't mean it's absolutely true. Yeah, but even... It gives more credence to the fact that it's true. I mean, you the Bible reads like if someone... As if you're talking to the person right there, as if what he said in the Bible is actually what he said. But there's no way to prove that. Even, even if you do have eyewitness account, I mean, telephone past eight people breaks down. Oh, it's real simple. Faith in Christ is not based on a nuance of some philosophical or theological point. Faith in Christ is based on his life, death, and resurrection.